Welcome to Fisher Webinars. The following is a recording of email marketing to the paper industry, originally presented on Thursday, March 12, 2015. Today we'll be talking about email marketing to the paper industry. So we'll start off our discussion looking at some of the advantages of email marketing. And then we'll go into some of the pitfalls that exist and mistakes that companies make, which are avoidable, but they are dangerous. After that, I'll show you some ways that you can build effective, powerful email campaigns. And we'll look at some real world examples. So why email marketing? Well, in order to answer this question, we first need to look at the paper industry, what's involved uh, selling and marketing into it. We know that no two machines are alike and no two mills are alike. They make different products, they have different issues, different challenges, different strengths. Similarly, suppliers have a complex, diverse set of products and services to meet the needs of the mills. It's a very technical industry and there are a lot of technical sort of considerations involved in every sale. There also tends to be a high dollar amount associated with each sale. So every decision is an important one, and it's taken very seriously by the mills. This is also a very capital intensive industry, so the mills consider every potential change, every decision to be risky, not only in terms of what, it's, what the actual solution is changing, but anything else that might be impacted as a result. All this being said, it, it uh, follows that this is a long sales cycle and that building trust and strong relationships is incredibly important. Looking at all of these considerations, direct marketing is highly suited to the paper industry. And it's one of Fisher's recommend, recommendations to suppliers. But don't just take our word for it. This is something that marketers have been saying for decades, that the strategy you devise depends on the complexity of your message and the number of people that you're trying to reach. Let's look at a few different models. When you consider selling products that have a somewhat uh, less complex message, things like retail paper products, beauty aids, other consumer products, they tend to select traditional advertising, maybe a TV spot uh, or a one-page ad in a, in a magazine or in a trade publication. Traditional advertising makes sense in this, in this way because the message is pretty, pretty straightforward. So imagine something like toilet paper. It's soft. It's strong. You're trying to reach a lot of people. There's not a lot of very specific information that needs to be communicated. So that, the cost per impression and getting in front of those millions of people that might be buying it makes sense. Also, when you're looking at um, things like selling basic chemicals, steel, or fuel, it's also a relatively low complexity in terms of the message. And also, there aren't a lot of buyers that are, are buying steel, for example. So direct sales is the way to go there. As we move into the more complex messaging, things like selling cars, pharmaceuticals, ERP systems, and other software, the complexity of the applications are fairly sophisticated and robust. So in this case, this is where direct marketing materials need to be used. If you picture something like a uh, pharmaceutical sales rep, they'll need very detailed leave-behind brochures that they can pass out, that they can distribute, that explain all the potential side effects, uh, all the trials that have been done, uh, everything else. And then the missionary sales approach is needed to support that, um, the pharmaceutical rep going around talking with all the doctors and keeping that relationship going and answering any specific questions. Most of the suppliers in this industry, I think, fall into this quadrant which is the high message complexity, in fact, so complex that it's often engineers that are involved in these conversations or just people that have been in the industry for so long, they have a, a very uh, sophisticated knowledge of all their product applications, um, when it's indicated, all the potential consequences for making changes, things like this. 
but it's a relatively low number of people that are, are you're trying to reach. Not that there's not a lot of people in the, in the paper industry, but when you look at who you need to speak with that's managing that particular area of the mill and interested in a specific application, it's not a lot of, of people. And the direct marketing approach is important because there's all kinds of technical information that must be involved and you need, you need the ability to be able to do that. Email marketing is a subset of direct marketing. So why email marketing in particular? Well, it's got some certain advantages. The first is it's immediate. This is one of the only types of marketing you can do where you can get in front of someone right then and there. People are on their email, like it or not, this is where we spend most of our time. So it ends up being, even if they're on the road or traveling, you know they'll probably see the email very soon on their phone. It's also a highly customizable platform, which lends itself very nicely to adjusting the, the messaging for different applications, adjusting the recipient list, being able to decide who should see this, who, who doesn't need to see it, um, changing out text, images, and repurposing the platform over and over again. Email also offers a low barrier of engagement. It's low risk for someone to express interest with an email. They don't have to commit. They're not, uh, they're not going anywhere. They're not even picking up the phone. They just write a quick response, send me some information, or I'd like to talk with you about this. It's also easy for recipients to forward your email, which is not the case with most types of marketing. You know, taking an ad out and, and giving it to someone, a physical ad, is different. It's so easy to just forward a message. And you really want that as much as possible because anything that's shared is much more likely to be read because they're, they're considering the email content that much more if it's referred by a, a colleague. It's also a digital uh, platform which makes everything measurable and trackable. It's one of the few types of marketing that you can really track your success and you can learn all kinds of things about how people are, are interested or, or not interested to your messaging. This allows you to even isolate different variables, test something different, and see what's, uh, what's changing and optimizing the campaign over time. It's always also relatively low cost. You can, once you design the template and you have a, a strategy, from there it's just a matter of repurs re, uh, repurposing that content and you can do that over and over, adjust the recipient list and everything else. So if email marketing is so great, why is there a negative connotation around it for some people? Well, this is what some people will say, that it's annoying, it's overly promotional, that it's spam. But that's really only if it's executed poorly, because people appreciate helpful, relevant information. Think of email marketing as a double-edged sword. It has the capability to do some amazing things, but it also can be you know, misused and applied in a way where it does the experience for the user is spam. Sales efforts must be face-to-face. -face. This is what people will often say, especially in this industry, with the high dollar amount, everything else, and this is why um, nothing will ever replace face-to-face. -face. But you do need other tactics to support that, particularly with the long sales cycle that's involved and all the considerations that mills make before they make a decision. Because there's just not enough time and money to be face-to-face -face often enough. Some people may even say email marketing is good for real digital industries, but in the paper industry, it, it doesn't work. But the reality is that the people that are making decisions about whether or not to use your products or to have a relationship with you, they're online and reading email just like everybody else. And it goes back to how the execution is, because it can, email can just be effective in any industry. The pulp and paper industry is no exception. So what makes email marketing work or not work? Well, I think a lot of why email marketing gets a bad rap is that 
a lot of companies send out big blast emails to anyone and everyone. And the fact is that those can be not only not, not help what you're trying to do, but they can be dangerous and harmful to your brand and the relationships you work so hard to build. And it's really because you're sending out an untargeted email message. And here's what happens when you do that. First, you send the message that you just don't understand the customer's business, which this is something you would never do when you're talking to someone. You would never start bringing up products that they have no say over or that don't relate to their business or, or what they're trying to achieve. So email marketing should be no different. It's part of the conversation that you have with your prospects and your existing customers. What happens is you'll end up training people, your customers, to ignore communications that they get from you. Because it doesn't take too many times to get a message that's not helpful or applicable to start ignoring that company. And over time, they'll start to associate your brand with spam. And it can be very difficult to regain your position in terms of the company itself, let alone the, the representatives and the people that are involved with the company. And people get so impatient because we're all so bombarded with information all the time that it doesn't take long for this process to develop to where someone starts to develop this type of opinion or see you as, as spamming them. And eventually, you'll lose the privilege to talk with your customers altogether. Think of it as throwing out a bunch of darts. And you're just kind of hoping something sticks. You're not really sure about how they might find value, but you're just saying, well, we've got all these email addresses. We should be doing email. Let's, let's see if we can get a sale out of this. Not only is the effect that you're not going to reach anyone because none of the messaging is going to be targeted for them, and they'll see, they'll see right through that. But the other impact is the effect on your relationships, and it can really cut off that communication. Once the communication is cut off, you may never get it back. So how can you create a powerful, effective email campaign? The key is relevance. And there's really two main components of this that suppliers need to consider. The first is that your message must relate very closely to the mill or company, their specific problems, their unique assets, and the markets that they serve. The other part is it needs to be relevant to the recipient because it's going to someone's inbox. So it must relate to their area of responsibility. If you sell a product that's used on a paper machine, let's say, or an actual paper machine, and you're sending a message to everyone you know in that mill because you think that they need this paper machine, but it ends up going out to, let's say, someone in the bleach plant or something like that or in the wood yard. To that person, it's irrelevant. You're basically sending them something that not only can they not influence that decision, they won't be involved in it. As we all know, mills are huge. A lot of times they operate in independent silos from each other. They may not even know what type of uh, assets are on the existing machines. So it really does need to be both of those components. And we know that about 40% of people who subscribe to any email sign-up later will mark it as spam because they feel that the messages they're receiving are actually irrelevant. And I think that this number is conservative because if you, if you think about it, it only counts the people who are actually marking as spam. There's a whole host of other people that are rolling their eyes and deleting the email and forming a negative opinion about the sender, about the company, and that isn't included in this statistic. So how relevant must your emails be? Well, let's define relevance. It means that the recipient or the reader clearly understands three things, that you know who they are, you understand a problem that they're having, and you have an effective solution to their problem. You want your email to stand out amongst all the others, not only in com competition with your direct competitors, other suppliers, but also to that it must be as important and as more relevant or as relevant as the other messages that that person is receiving. That could be emails from their boss, their spouse, their kids. That's very difficult to do. 
so it's got to be very relevant. Let's look at some email marketing best practices. Um, these are things that, guidelines that you should employ in order to increase the effectiveness of your campaigns. Make sure that you send some useful information and tips in your email. Don't always have them be promotional. It's just like if you're talking to someone on the phone or in person, you're not going to always be talking about your company, what products you have, promotions you're having or whatever. You're going to, it's a dialogue. You're talking about their business, their problems, the industry, what's happening in the industry. Email marketing, I think, gets abused in this way because a lot of companies just see it as, as a promotional tool. But it's more than that. And really, the, the true value of email marketing is when you can leverage it in this way because it's great for sending things that are of interest in terms of useful information and you know maybe white papers or things like this that really show the mills that you're that you understand their business and that you're a partner and that's always what they say time and time again is that they aren't interested in working with suppliers that don't act as partners make sure that the design of the email itself is consistent with your brand's look feel and tone also, that it's easy to read and click on. And this takes into account all types of platforms. So make sure that the text size, the size of the buttons, all of that will work on a phone just as it would on a desktop computer. And responsive design just refers to uh, the ability for the email to render properly regardless of the platform it's being viewed on. So just like you, your prospects are looking at things on their phone, uh, make sure that, it, that the user experience accounts for that. Be sure to include clear calls to action. Your emails aren't just notes or stories. They're efforts that you're making to engage with your prospects and existing customers. So you want to make sure that you guide them where, where it makes sense for them to go. If it's learning more information, if it's uh, getting an audit, whatever it is. So have those be very visible, uh, the button, have the appropriate color so it stands out, things like that. And be sure to check all of the links to make sure that they open up properly and that no one's sent to an error or a non-existent page. Similarly, you want to be sure that any call to action or any link embedded within the email will send the person to an appropriate landing page. If they are clicking on learning more about this product, don't send them to the home page. Send them to that product landing page or um, you know, something that relates to that. Check the frequency and timing of all of your email publications. First, you don't want to wear out your welcome. Don't send so many that even though they're useful and um, applicable, it just gets annoying. So, Keep that in mind in terms of what you're sending out, how often it is to, uh, it makes sense to engage with people. And also think about the timing of the actual sending. You don't want to send around holidays or on a Friday afternoon at 5 p.m., things like that. So think about day of the week, time of day. Make sure that all unsubscribe links are always visible on the email and the website itself. You don't want to frustrate people or appear to be spammy by hiding those things. And you should always publish in smaller batches. Don't do one big dump, not only because of the relevance issue we looked at, but also companies will tend, their firewalls will tend to intercept emails that look suspicious because they're going out to too many people. So if you send one email to 200 people in a mill, they're gonna, it's going to stand out. It doesn't have to be that high of a number, by the way. Similarly, don't have the file be so large, either so image heavy that it's, uh, that it's a large file or with, with big attachments. Um, and on the long of those same lines, the subject line is relevant too because you want to make sure that you're not using things that make your email look spammy like highly promotional, we're selling everything with a bunch of exclamation points and all caps or things like that. Those types of emails will very likely be intercepted by the company's firewall. 
And a lot of times you may not even realize that's what's happening because you, you might just get a bunch of bounce notifications and think that there's something wrong with the email addresses and it could be something just this simple on your end that you can adjust. Let's look at a real world example. Let's consider a bearing product that solves oil leak problems on Beloit design paper machines with calendars made in the 80s and 90s. What might a relevant email message look like? Let's say something like this. First, I'm writing to you because you operate a relatively high-speed Beloit machine, PM4, that has a hard nip calendar. This shows you know exactly who the customer is. You may have seen oil leaks under the calendar, a common problem on Beloit machines with calendars manufactured between 1980 and 1997. This shows you understand their problem. This problem comes from bearing leaks caused by an underdesigned bearing supplied with the original equipment. We make bearings designed to withstand the high loads and high speeds of calendar stacks. This shows you have a solution to their problem. Our bearings are now working on machines throughout North America and have been installed on 35% of machines similar to yours. This shows you have relevant experience and your solution is low risk. So who might you send a message like this to? Should this go to everyone that you have their email address and that is connected in some way to the paper industry? Definitely not recommended. It should go to the relevant mills and people only. In this case, we're looking for maintenance managers and mills who have Beloit paper machines with operating calendar stacks built during the 80s and 90s. So it's a very specific group of people. Where are they located? Well, there are 90 mills in North America with 121 such machines. This is a chart that I exported from Fisher Solve that shows the number of Beloit design paper machines in North America distributed by the area of the United States or Canada. So if you are sending an email to these prospects, and if it's more than 90 or so people that it's going out to, you know that you're spamming, spamming people. A lot of companies like to use email to launch new products. So how can a supplier do that? without spamming people, sending it to a large group but having it be applicable. Well, you have to think about how different groups of people will be interested in this new product. And you can use Fisher Solve for segmentation. Let's take another example. Let's imagine an equipment supplier that's launching a new product in the U.S. that improves turbine performance. You would start by first finding all the mills in the United States whose power needs have changed since the last turbine was installed. And from there, you really want to narrow in on the mills that have the relatively highest energy costs, because that's signaling a problem. And this is just one segment. You could now do this for other groups that, of, of people that might be interested in your product, but for different reasons and different benefits. You then want to send email campaigns announcing the new product and its particular benefits to each of those groups. So looking at the mills with the relatively newer machines and pulp lines and relatively older turbines, I've exported this map from Fisher Solve that shows the map of mills with the pulp lines or machines built within the last 15 years and turbines that are at least 15 years old. We can immediately get a sense of the size of the market. Each symbol will represent one of the mills. And the, the symbol color and size uh, or symbol color and shape will just depend on other specifications that are, are available. So things like if it's integrated or, or paper only um, or if it's an operating or green filled mill. From there, we want to look at those mills on a cost curve to get a sense of who might have an energy issue. So Fisher. Does a, uh, has a cost benchmarking module that's built on the basis of a mass energy balance algorithm that we've constructed that calculates the cost position of every mill and machine in the world based on what they produce, the quantities, the recipe needed, um, the location, and many other factors. So right now we're just looking at the energy cost curve of those particular mills. And we can quickly see which ones lie in that fourth quadrant who have the biggest problems with energy. From here, we can use Fisher Solve to calculate the expected ROI from our product. So I've exported uh, the cost benchmarking data into Excel. And you'll see 
in each column we have the mill, the amount of production, the energy usage or cost per ton. And then that last column on the right is um, what I put together on my own that would be something that you can do that calculates the amount of, of savings in this case that you could bring each mill. So this is using the other information that's related and then going ahead and calculating the uh, number of dollars per ton that you would be saving the mill. And you can use this information in your email. So rather than just saying vaguely, we can save you money, which is what the mills hear all day long, this allows you to make a much more compelling case by giving them a sense of dollar amounts or ranges or percentages. Then we can use Fisher Solve's personnel module to create a very targeted list of the right people. So based on those mills, I can now pull up, you'll see that there's 117 mills, and I can now filter out by the number of, um, by the people that I want to reach out to that would be involved in this decision. And in this case, it's 19 different records. You want to describe the problem that your, your product solves in the email very specifically. So it might say something like explaining that there's steam and ba power balances that change as mills are upgraded, that you think that their turbine may not be operating as efficiently as when it was first installed, your product will reduce their energy costs, and here's the expected ROI. From there, you always want to offer either free audit, learn more, request information, something via a strong call to action to engage. You always want to tailor your message based on the mill's needs and situation. Just as if you're talking to someone, you're going to take into account what not only their specific needs, but what's happening in that mill. What markets are they serving? What are they thinking about? What keeps them up at night? So if you know that a mill is having trouble just surviving, it's going to affect the products that you bring up and the benefits that you talk about. We can use Fisher Solve for segmentation to determine their needs and then via the viability module to get a sense of which machines or mills are likely to survive or not. Um, Fisher has a, a viability um, tool that calculates not only the expected position in terms of the mill and machine cost issues, but it takes into account other related issues that impact the likelihood that it will survive. Things like the technical age of major equipment, the capital required to, for a rebuild, um, the scale of the operation, the grades that they produce. Let's look at another example. Picture a North American supplier that makes a ceiling strip for size presses on machines that are up to 390 inches wide. Let's say that the supplier is pursuing the wider paper machines because they can sell more ceiling strip. And assume that the product provides different benefits so to, the, to each mill depending. So cost savings, overall runnability of the machine, product quality. Which mills should the email campaign target and what might the message be? The first step is to find all the mills with size presses. So this is a bar chart that I've exported from Fisher Solve that shows where all the size presses are in North America distributed by the paper machine width. And you'll see that these ones on the right, these are the wider machines, which we said the supplier was most interested in pursuing. So all the machines that are at least 240 inches wide. From here, we can use Fisher's viability module to narrow our targets, and then we'll adjust our, our message in the email accordingly. So this shows all of those wider paper machines. We've pulled those out. And then we're now seeing which ones are least or most competitive. So uh, the green ones on the left, those represent the ones, the machines that are least likely to shut down. And then as you go up on the curve, these are the machines that are most at risk. So if you were going after maybe the ones that are strong, let's say at a stronger position, maybe you were concerned that the machine would be shut down and you'd spend a lot of time and it wouldn't go anywhere. Then you might focus on those the machines that are represented with the green bars. And your messaging might be things like the, how, how the ceiling strip will help improve runnability and their overall product quality, because those are the things that they would be thinking about. But if, if you wanted to pursue the machines that you thought were 
you know, in a position where they were highly motivated to, to do something to make an impact. And maybe buying a new ceiling strip is a relatively uh, quick decision that they could make and it could still impact things like their costs. Then you might go after those machines that are on the uh, upper side of the curve that are mo most at risk for shutting down and your message would change. You probably wouldn't be talking as much about the product quality being improved, but more about here's something that we can do for you that will help you save some money and will make you more com the machine more competitive. From there, we can use Fisher Solve to find um, all the right people and send out a very targeted email campaign. We can also extract certain areas of the database that relate to the campaigns we send out and the messaging we want to include. So I've exported this uh, list from Fisher Solve that shows those uh, wider paper machine uh, width machines and includes their, the email addresses of the appropriate people. I've also uh, taken out what grades they're making, uh, whether it's a film press, conventional press, in case those variables relate to uh, the sales that I'm making, how I'm segmenting my list, and the message that I want to convey in the email. So obviously, none of us want to spam our prospects or existing customers. So it's really important that you relevance test every single email campaign. So I'd like you to think about, do you know which emails are going out to which people? Be sure that every email passes the relevance test and that it clearly communicates those three things. You know who they are, you understand a problem that they're having, and you have an effective solution to their problem. So if we look at our dartboard now, we have a clear strategy for what we're trying to do, what our message is, and who we should be talking to.